folks, just to kind of keep uh, in the rhythm of the life that is, the church life that is here, I wanted uh, to invite Eddie and Christy to come up and share a neighbor, some neighboring stories. We are attempting and we are praying, we are uh, asking God to help us meet with our neighbors. And that as we meet with them and get to know them, he'll open opportunities for us to share the love of Jesus with them, and not only in, in the gospel, but also just in loving them. And so, Kitty, she's the designated speaker. So if you'll just share with us what God's doing in your neighborhood. Good morning. Um, we're both very emotional this morning. Um. Reaching out to our neighbors has actually been a healing process for us. We lost our daughter um, a year ago this past summer. And it would have been so easy to just kind of shelter ourselves away from everything and everyone. But we live in a fairly new neighborhood. And the neighborhood's only about six years old, and in that time, all of the neighbors across the street have moved out and new people came in. And it just so happened that all of the ones across the street moved in within weeks of losing our daughter. And they reached out to us. Well, they would see my husband outside, and he had the opportunity to share our loss. And they, they've just been very kind to us. So last Easter... Um, we reached out to them. We were following along, you know, going out and meeting your neighbors. And the first outing was on Easter. We just dropped off little gifts for all the neighbors. And that evening, the neighbors across the street that have four children wrote us a beautiful, beautiful little thank you card. And it just brought back memories of when our children were young. And um, that was Easter, and, they, and then the other neighbors reached out. And over the summer, we had a birthday parade for our granddaughter and made sure all the neighbors got cupcakes and candy and treats. And next morning, one of the neighbors had left a little gift on our porch without a name or anything for our granddaughter. So we just started feeling the love being given back to us. And then... Um, at Halloween, you know, you you know, you feel for the kids that are so excited about the candy and couldn't go out and so we waited till it was dark and we went and put little candy bags in front of all the neighbors' house with children. At Thanksgiving we went and delivered some pies. When the church had the, the uh gift the uh, food boxes available, I I felt very I felt it in my heart that one of our neighbors needed the assistance, and we went and dropped it off, and they were very grateful. And when we went at uh, Thanksgiving time, um, one of the neighbors was kind of already ready, and she had a little poinsettia plant for us. And um, it's just now waving, and you're really not just waving. You're waving because you really care about these people. You're waving because you feel that they care about us. I just like to say um, how cool it would be to be on the other side of the door when somebody knocks just to know. And it wasn't. It's it. It isn't anything difficult to do. And a few times I've had to apologize and say, "I'm sorry. Can you tell me your names again?" And then we run home and we write them down. <laughs> you know, the number of the house and their name. Then after a while. You know, you don't feel like they're strangers anymore. You remember the names. And when you're waving, you know, you're waving at Andy. Or you're wave, you know, you're not just waving at your neighbor. Uh, the next door neighbors to us are an elderly couple, and she started sending over dinners. And so we feel like that door has been opened, and now we need the opportunity to share. And as I told Pastor the other day, is that the hope is that knowing that we've lost that maybe somebody's saying, how do they do it? And that'll give us an opportunity to say that it's because we found our way back home. And that it's by the grace of God that we're here. 
Thank you. I was um, I was talking to the supervisor of this construction crew. Um, the construction crew is working on Sam Snead. It's a water drainage prop, uh, pro yeah, project. Thank you. And uh, um, they, the owner of that company had come here over a year ago and said, can we rent that property down there? And they said, it's a large property. I cannot rent it to you, but you can use it. And they were a little taken back by that. And that's why they're parked down there. And they take such good care of it. And they were like, well, are there things we can do for you? And although we wouldn't rent it to them, they have faithfully donated every month to our ministry here. And uh, so we're hoping that project will last a lot longer. <laughs> but I went to talk to the supervisor because we needed some we needed some sand back here for the school. We, our sandbox was empty. And so I said, in all of this digging that you're doing around here, you know, can you, uh, is there some sand? Have you dug up some sand? Oh, no, this is all dirty sand. I'm going to go buy some sand. And the next thing I knew, there, there was a dump truck of sand out there. We just needed a sand box. But, you know, he had gone and got a full truckload of sand. But that day when I asked him about the sand, he said, you know what? I have decided I'm changing my religion. Uh, uh, I'm going to be whatever you guys are. What are you guys? <laughs> and it's the second time he had said that, you know. And so I said, you know, you don't change your religion just by saying, I'm changing my religion. You need to come to church, you know, and, and learn. And he goes, well, that's what hallelujah always says. And I go, what? And he goes, the guy over here, hallelujah. And there's a Christian there on that crew. That he is known as Hallelujah. Why do you suppose he's known as Hallelujah? He has a testimony. And he calls him over. And he goes, Hallelujah. He says, I have to go to church too. Well, I don't know what Hallelujah's name is. But he goes, well, he's right. You need to go to church. It was fun. And there was an entire crew standing and listening. This man had been born and grew up in Lebanon. Okay? And so there was a whole crew listening. I did not give him any notice, but I'm going to ask Ben, would you come up here, brother, and just tell us a little bit about your testimony at the workplace. Come on up here. I, I, catching him by surprise. It's not easy. You can wear the mask, and that'll cover. So you can kind of hide there. And uh, just tell us a little bit about uh, your testimony at work. Uh, well, I work with a... Uh, uh, Guy named Danny, uh, Alex. They're, um, it's a new crew that I'm on. I work for the city of El Paso. So they're young men. They're uh, married kids, but they're not very, uh, I guess you would say, uh, faithful. They have eyes. They look around. So I just tell them, um, you know, I, I just read to them, and I play Christian music, and I just tell them about, about marriage and how sacred it should be. Uh, it's, it's hard, but... Uh, I think uh, the goodness out outweighs the, you know, the negative. The positive outweighs the negative. Uh, I'm just—I let them know this morning. I'm going to pray for them at church. I put them on the prayer list, uh, and uh, I let them know they're well. I hope God hears me or hears you in the prayer or whatever. So it's just uh, being out there and, and talking to people about Jesus and let them know that He's He's returning and uh, I care for them and uh, I would love to see Him here. Church, they they never come, but uh, they know I'm a Christian. Uh, they know what I listen to. They know I don't. They know I fast on Wednesdays, and uh, it's just a, a blessing to be able to. Because I, whenever they're alone, they'll go talk to me. But in a group, they're like you know, they're men. But um, it, it's it's hard, and sometimes it gets difficult because I just wish they would snap. And uh, yeah, you know, we're not perfect. We we make mistakes. The thing is. But we're forgiven, and, and I just thank Jesus Christ every day for what He's done for us. And I'm glad for this church. I love this church. So, pretty much it. So, um, uh, Christine, you asked me if we still had the food boxes because I remember you were taking them to your neighbor. We do not have access to those anymore. 
but if there is anyone who has a neighbor, now normally we require people to come to the worship service if we're going to give them food, but if you have a neighbor that you know is in need and you want to take them a, a food box out of our food pantry, you can go back there and Grace will help you make a food box if somebody knows. Another thing, I'd like you to be looking on your street if you see some children and maybe their clothes are a little worn out or whatever, get a good look at their size and then come to our clothing closet. Let Grace help you pick out some nice clothes and, and you take those clothes uh, to the kids as well so that uh, just to give them a gift. And the Lord is blessing us with nice things back there. I'd like to see those things being worn somewhere. So just get it, be looking on your street, see who's in need of food or of clothing and, uh, and you be the church's outreach uh, to to that street, are you your your Christ ambassador there, and the church has resources that can help. What I'd like to do is I'm going to impose upon Tom now. If you would, Tom, would you pray for uh, for Eddie and Christy for the ministry they're doing there? Would you pray? I know that you are dealing with a drug dealer there on your street, or have been. Would you pray over that? Would you pray over Ben's uh, testimony and in his workplace? And would you also pray for Hallelujah down there and what he's doing? <laughs> So, yeah, there is kind of a rhythm of life here in the church. Uh, uh, this um, Every year we have one business meeting. Praise God, just one. Every year, and it's not really a business meeting. We talk about what has happened in the past year and what we're looking at in the future. Um, we will do the same thing. We will be looking at 2021. If the business meeting will be on Sunday night, next Sunday night, the 20th. What time did I say? Does anybody remember? Six? Six, huh? Is it 6.30? Thank you, Irene. You're the clerk, so that's the official word. <laughs> we will be voting on our officers. President uh, uh, Patrick Sarabia uh, has agreed to continue. Vice President uh, Charlie Garza has agreed to continue. And uh, Secretary Treasurer. Uh, Gray, she's also agreed to continue in the office, but we, we need to vote uh, on that um, for legal reasons. And so we'll be doing that, and I'll also be talking about what's coming in the coming year. Next Sunday, I'll be preaching um, on this prophecy out of Isaiah chapter 7, verse 14, and we'll kind of, next Sunday, we'll be kind of setting up uh, for the Sunday night and for 2021. But I'd like to ask you a question just to kind of get your brain working in the right direction. Um, I'm going to need each one of you to memorize one chapter in the Bible for when they take our Bibles away from us. So which chapter would you memorize? Mark is the shortest in the New Testament. I've already taken that one. So um, uh, which chapter will you Memorize. That's how the persecuted church in China is doing right now. Uh, for us in the past, it's always been, well, we don't need to do that because there's no way this could ever happen. How confident are you in that position today? And we'll be discussing a little bit about that. But now, when I ask you the question, which chapter will you memorize that may seem to you like off the charts, and there's the problem. To consider memorizing a chapter of Scripture being off the charts, maybe that's a problem. Did you know that Hebrew children memorized the entire first five books of the Bible by the time they were 12 years old? Every Jewish king had to write in his own hand the entire law of the Lord before he sat upon the throne. That was the commandment of God. For us, well, I've got my electronics, I'm okay. Well, just consider that question. Is it really that big? Is it that big 
of a thing to an ask. Only to an American Christian is it too big to ask. So I just kind of want to put that out there to kind of set the tone. <laughs> what a wonderful tone, right? <laughs> but uh, I'd rather us uh, be prepared and in truth than to be living um, in, in uh, non-reality. Another thing that I wanted to present to you this morning, not the thing, but people, if I could get Rosie and Romy to come up here with me. <clears throat> the elders would like to present to you Romy Ali and Rosie Ali for church membership here. I wondered how you feel about that. Uh, right? uh, and so I just want to say welcome home. Welcome home. God bless you. And thank you for all you do. You guys have been working so hard here in the school, and we see your hand everywhere. So I'm glad, happy to have you as members here of this family. Welcome home. This morning, the message will be taken out of Matthew chapter 1, verses 18 through 25. I will be breaking this passage of Scripture into two parts, dealing with verses 18 through 23 first, and then we will look at verses 24 and 25. Matthew chapter 1, beginning in verse 18 through 23. Let me read it to you, and then we'll discuss it. It says, Now the birth of Jesus Christ was as follows. When his mother Mary had been betrothed to Joseph, before they came together, she was found to be with child by the Holy Spirit. And Joseph, her husband, being a righteous man and not wanting to disgrace her, planned to send her away secretly. But when he had considered this, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary as your wife, for the child who has been conceived in her is of the Holy Spirit. She will bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. Now all this took place to fulfill what was spoken by the Lord through the prophet. Notice this prophecy. Behold, the virgin shall be with child, and shall bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which translated means God is with us. Now that is the passage of scripture that we'll be preaching from next week, that Isaiah chapter 7, verse 14, that prophecy. But this week, I'd like us to focus on Joseph for a few moments. And I'd like to uh, to, to focus on him, uh, uh, just kind of imagining for a moment what's going on in his life. Do you see, in those days when you were betrothed, it went like this. A man who was 20, 21 22, kind of established in life, uh, would be engaged to a girl, 13, 14, 15, somewhere in there. Um, and they were there would be a covenant between the two families. They're not married, but they are promised, and the covenant cannot be broken. And what's going to take place now during this period of betrothal is the man is going to go build a house, and he's going to get things ready to take his wife to the new house. So they are, in a sense, married, but not beginning their lives together. He's building the house. She's sewing curtains. And they take about a year to do this. And, and can you imagine the anticipation of the wedding day? Can you imagine when he's off work, after work hours, him going home and putting the door in and thinking of opening it for his wife, building the marriage bed. And, and the, all of the community would bring dishes and the things that this young couple is going to need, and the entire village would be looking forward to this life together. And so there is Joseph working in his father's carpenter shop, perhaps, and in the evening going home, and with love building the home that he and Mary are going to spend the rest of their lives together in. And he's thinking of what his life is going to be like. And suddenly, the Lord decides to intrude on that dream. Now, he does not know it's the Lord who's intruded. All he knows 
is this one, his loved one, who he has been working so hard for and who he's been living a dream about the future, it, this one is suddenly pregnant. Can you imagine the betrayal? All of his dreams smashed in an instant. That's what happened at the birth of Jesus. Joseph's plans, Joseph's purposes, Joseph's dreams for his life in a moment are shattered. Can you imagine the confusion? What am I going to do now? I can have her killed. But no, I love her. But let's just settle this quietly. First question is this. Does God have the right to interrupt Joseph's life like that? Back several years ago, I started noticing an advertising phrase. I don't know. When I was growing up in the 70s, new and improved was the phrase. You guys remember that? The new improved tide. And you're like, well, what was the old one then? And every, every time, and it's always in bright letters, new and improved was the, was the advertising catchphrase that caused people to buy the product. Or bigger and better. Or on sale. Every car always was on sale. I'm like, well, why do you even have a regular price? So that we can say on sale. There are advertising slogans that cause us to buy. They are studied. They are tested, and then they are plastered. And a few years ago, I saw one coming out, and it's on almost every commercial, particularly the commercials with lawyers, right? I'm going to get you everything you deserve. Everything now that is advertised is this is what you deserve. When I was growing up, deserve meant you earned it, you worked for it. But nowadays... Over the years, through this advertising process, America has developed a culture. This phrase has caused us to think, if I were born, I have certain things that I deserve because I'm born. I don't need to have a job. I don't need to do anything. These are just my things. And I'm going to make sure that I get all the things that I'm supposed to get. Well, what are the things that you're supposed to get? Everything that they have. Yes, but they worked. Well, don't, don't confuse the issue with facts. Whatever they have, that's my due. And we get a sense that our lives are ours. Joseph is working hard now, and he deserves to have what he has dreamed for. In fact, that's another thing in our secular society that they say, you can have anything you dream for. Really? Really? I want to be seven foot and, and, and beat Shaq O'Neal one-on-one. -on -one. It's not going to happen, guys. But there's this concept that we have that, that I, I deserve a certain thing. You consider your lives right now. Consider what you're thinking of for your future. Those are yours. Does God have the right to intrude in such a fashion that all of your dreams are shattered. I'm hearing some yeses. Is everybody in agreement? Here in church, yes. But at nighttime after he does it, he and I are going to have a conversation. What are you doing, God? You're not doing things the way my, I'm thinking. You're not going my direction. I'd like you to consider Joseph for a moment. If you want to talk about, I mean, sometimes, you know, we have a dream. I, I, I've got a, a brother who he's getting ready to have a grandchild. And all of the dreams that they have for this grandchild, and they find that the grandchild's left side of the brain and right side have it formed. And the grandchild, uh, their heart and their lungs have them formed. And when the child is born, the child will not have a normal life. Do you see how those dreams are intruded upon. 
You know, that's what takes place with Joseph. His life is interrupted. Why? I'd like us, first of all, consider this. When they asked Jesus, teach us how to pray, Jesus said, well, when you pray, pray our Father in heaven. And what's the first thing? Hallowed be your name. And now what? Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth, but not here. On earth is good. In El Paso, in Gray's life, but I've got some dreams. Your will be done there, but my will be done here. Lesson number one for this morning. Is it possible for us to set aside what we deserve to not fall for that campaign trick that I believe comes from Satan? For us as Christians to not have that mentality and instead our mentality is hallowed be your name, your will be done here, right here. That's what Joseph has to face because at first he's going, this is just a betrayal. This is one of those things in life where, where just this oddity happens. She has betrayed me. My heart is broken. But then a dream comes and he's told, no, no, Joseph, this is not what you're thinking. I have decided to intrude into your life. Let's look at Matthew chapter 1, verses 24 through 25 now. And Joseph awoke from his sleep, and he began to accuse God and say, Wait a minute, why is this happening to me? And he said, I've been praying daily about this marriage, and why aren't you answering my prayers? I was praying that we would have children together, and now I am not to touch her, and there's another child, and I never wanted to be a stepfather. What is wrong with you, God? Does that sound familiar at all, by the way? Have any of us done that? Don't do that. Because we all just confessed here that he has the right to intrude. No, it says that Joseph awoke from his sleep and did as the angel of the Lord commanded him. And he took Mary as his wife, but kept her a virgin until she gave birth to a son and he called his name Jesus. Joseph, as a, as a man of faith, lives the life that God has given him. Joseph lives your kingdom Come here. <coughs> but there's something else taking place here other than just the interruption and the, just the intrusion. There's another aspect that is happening here. And in order for to, us to see that fully, if you don't mind, can I take you to the cross for a moment? Would you turn in your Bibles to John chapter 19? John chapter 19. Look with me to verses 26 through 27. Jesus now, and to give you context, Jesus is there suspended between heaven and earth on a piece of wood with his nails and his feet hammered to it. He is about, he is about to die. When Jesus, from that position, when Jesus saw his mother and the disciple whom he loved, that's John, when he saw his mother and the disciple whom he loved standing nearby, he said to his mother, Woman, behold your son. And then he said to the disciple, Behold your mother. And from that hour, the disciple took her into his household. Do you see Jesus hanging on the cross looks at his Disciple John, I have a mission for you, John. For the rest of her life, 
I want you to take care of her. And John does. See, not only is Joseph's life interrupted and all of his dreams are gone and what he was going to do, but he's been handed another life, another mission. Mary is entrusted to him and the Son of God. He's given a mission, and in fact, you see him protectively escort her to Bethlehem where this child is going to be born. His life is intruded, but he receives a mission. See, it's not just enough for you to say, well, Lord, I accept whatever you're doing in my life. The next thing is, God, now what do you want me to do instead? What about Mary's life? It's interrupted also. How many young ladies have you counseled who suddenly their life is interrupted with a pregnancy? Beverly, how many have you talked to who suddenly their life is interrupted by a pregnancy? They have these dreams. Their teachers tell them, here's what your future is. And suddenly there's a pregnancy. Some of them are married. Some of them aren't. And they're facing this decision. If it's his kingdom come, his will be done here in my life, I need to be understanding that I am accepting a mission. Ezra, you just graduated. Congratulations. I don't know what you dreamed on doing, but I don't care. Find the mission God has for you and live the rest of your days taking care of what he entrusts to you. All of your days, take care of what he has entrusted to you. What about us as a church? You know, the church is the bride of Christ, and we are betrothed as he goes away to prepare a place for us, Jesus says. I, I'm going away to prepare a place. Do you know we're waiting we're waiting for the wedding day. We're waiting for him to say, the house is built. Here I come to get my bride. All of heaven is waiting for us to arrive. And meanwhile, we are supposed to be here doing what? Bearing fruit, church. Reproducing. We're supposed to be having baby Christians from our testimonies and from our life. Lord, would you please, please don't let us be barren. Please give us the opportunity to bring new believers into the world through the gospel message. What about us, church? Will we embrace that mission as the bride of Christ? Will the Holy Spirit hover over us and conceive in us new life? Let us pray so. Let us set aside whatever we were thinking we were going to be doing, whatever our thoughts of church are, and let us embrace and care for that ministry that he has given us. I'd like to go back to the cross for just a moment, back to that passage of Scripture in John chapter 19. Would you look at verses 16 through 18? This is before he entrusts his mother to his disciple John. Look at verses 16 through 18. So then they handed him over to them to be crucified. They handed Jesus over to be crucified. And they took Jesus, therefore. And he went out bearing his own cross to the place called the place of the skull which is called in Hebrew Golgotha, and there they crucified him. Why do I want to read this this morning? Would you listen? None of us can ever say, God, I want you to give me the life that I deserve. 
But there is one who can say that. If you if you listen to Joe Namath talking about Medicare, you're going to get all the benefits you deserve, right? Have you heard that? You're going to, a thousand times, Joe Namath and his hands are driving me nuts. Joe Namath is always going like this. To get all of the benefits you deserve. Did you really? Did you tell Joe Namath to shut up? Oh, you want to. Okay. Jesus Christ has earned a church to give him all the benefits that he deserves. Right? Amen? So when I look at you and I say, which book of the Bible will you memorize? Has he done enough to earn that type of an effort from you? A book like Genesis. You get Genesis, okay? Romy, Numbers. The book of Numbers. <laughs> Newest members always get the worst stuff. I'm sorry, okay? A book. Do you know my, my wife's mother has written the Bible by hand four times? My wife's mother has written the entire Bible by hand four times. What seems to us to be outrageous is just common, ordinary Christian living in other countries. Can, can we be a church that gives Jesus Christ all of the benefits he deserves? What did you hear this morning? Okay, start writing the Bible by hand. Thank you, Jared. That's awesome. And Jared, if you're thinking that that's way over the top, there is a person sitting in this room right now who has done it. Oh, everybody knows. Okay, I'm sorry. I tried to keep your secret. When she, when she heard, she brought me this stack of papers like this tall. Here, I'm done. What else did you hear? God has a right to intrude. What else did you hear? We don't deserve any benefits. Very good. What else did you hear? It's time the church in America heard this. I'm repeating everything because I got a complaint to people who listen to the sermons. They're going, I can't hear what the congregation is saying. So I'm repeating it for them, okay? For people like in Oklahoma or wherever, okay? What else did you hear today? The life we deserved is not the life we want, okay? What else? Accept it and share it. She said we have to accept the mission God has for our lives. Accept it and care for it as if you're taking it to Bethlehem. Protect it. Yes. Anything else did we hear today? Yes, Patty. Joseph was tested before he got what? The explanation. Sure. Yeah. Joseph was tested before he got the explanation. Anyone else? Your life is not your own. You are bought with the price. And there was someone else over here. Don't expect any explanation. Sometimes we don't get one, do we? So, now Joseph did, and he was given clear directions. Sometimes we don't get an explanation, and when we don't get an explanation in God's intrusion, what do we do? God is good all the time. Through the darkest hour, his light will shine. God is good. All the time. I know this. So therefore, Lord, I accept. I receive. Your will be done here. Amen? I'm going to ask the worship team to come. We come to the